Okay, so now we're in this section here that talks about the negotiation of the price and the terms. Now, whether this happens to be on the listing when you're negotiating it with your seller or if the buyer is negotiating with the seller and you are involved in this, this section applies to both of those situations. Now, what I want to do is go over here and visit a previous class that we talked about negotiations for a win-win on your client. And this is a huge part of this course to help you understand that negotiation is an event. It's a series of events or it's a procedure designed to produce some kind of an agreement between the two parties. It is a dialogue. It is not ever supposed to be a shouting match, okay? But let's be honest. All of those people that negotiate, not all of them have an interest in the other party. Most people or some people are only looking out for their own advantage and their assumption is that the only way they can win is for the other person to lose. And when you start thinking about negotiating, you actually have to realize that there are steps. It is a process of events that we have to think about. We have to discuss, is there some planning on what we're going to negotiate or how we're going to do it? Is there any ground rules? Well, the ground rules are kind of set for us in the real estate world because we have ethical rules that we have to play by, okay? Then we have some kind of justification of our offer, where it comes from, why are we choosing that? Then we have this problem solving solution back and forth, and then we have the closure that we are seeking in this deal. The first step is where both parties organize and accumulate the information to have an effective negotiation. This step is typically done prior to them meeting each other. The seller has already done his preparation when he's put the house on the market and the buyer has already determined his goals prior to typically meeting us. Hey, I want to live in this area, I want this size of house. So a lot of this kind of is already done for us. Same thing here with the ground rules. We don't have to really define where these are going to take place. Are there time constraints? Are there things we won't discuss? Because in the real estate, which is where we are applying these general rules to, already have a set of boundaries for us that we need to understand. Now, what is our initial position? What are we going to exchange? Once again, in this real estate realm that we're dealing with, we kind of already know what we are looking and seeking to exchange. One is going to exchange money. One is going to exchange real property. So we don't really have to have an educational kind of come to Jesus meeting with each other to talk about what we're giving or things like that nature. All right. So if you'll hold on just one second here. All right, I had a little technical trouble with the microphone there. I think we're back. So this is the clarification step that you must go through. Once again, I have said we have already kind of got that set for us. Then we actually come into the bargaining section. This is the negotiation. Now, here's the key that you guys need to understand and that you have to help convey to your client. Negotiation is when you're willing to give up something to get something. If you're actually asking for everything they're selling and you just want it at a lower price, that is called haggling. That's not negotiating. There are people all the time that go, oh, let's negotiate. Okay, I'll take the house, but I want to give you 140,000 instead of 150. You didn't give up anything. That is the definition of a negotiation. It's a mutual agreement to make sure that the offer and the value of both of whatever you're exchanging have equal amounts. All right. Now, 
Let's rule out for this conversation that someone is not overpriced because in theory, I guess I could see if someone's got a $150,000 house and they're fishing for a stupid buyer at 170, you could potentially go, yeah, I'll take that house at 150 because that's the market value. But let's assume we're in that realm of being realistic. You're going to trade that 150 for a house that's 150. Well, I may surrender something for to get the house at 145 that's what we're talking about you can't just offer you know a lower price and call that negotiation that is typically not negotiation process is all five pro has five steps all of these steps have to be completed it all has to be involved with the parties there is a systematic way to engage this negotiation. And there are four modes of negotiating. And this is mainly the key that I wanted to get to, as you can see over here, that there are four methods to negotiate. All right. Now, one of them there is called the retreating mode, and we probably won't really get into that one. Yeah. All right. So the cooperative mode is this is the one where everybody wants to make a better deal for everybody. Everybody is trying to work towards a better deal for each other. This is the better deal. The negotiation mode underlines the concerns in the negotiation and defines the problem with respects to what the other person can solve. In a cooperative mode, it requires more time to reach a deal because you have to understand the other side. This is the typical win-win situation where you understand what the other side's goal is rather than just trying to look at it for what's in it for me. All right. There is a lot of these investors that I've dealt with that literally will ask you, what do you want? Because if I can solve what you want, then I can potentially get a hold of that in some fashion and we can solve the problem. All right. So this is the cooperative mode on how you do it. The second one is more of a competitive mode. The competitive mode usually is a power oriented negotiation where one party wants to exert power over the other. Typically, the competitive mode is only used when your negotiation is the price item. Well, guess what? In the real estate world, it really boils down to that's what we are negotiating is price and not necessarily anything else. So what ends up happening is it are a lot of the uh, negotiations people feel is a competitive well, the problem with a competitive mode is this. By definition, it's a win-lose proposition. The only way for someone to pay less, i.e. win, means that the buyer has to accept less and, or the seller would accept less and that would be seen as a loss. So that's the problem with that. Now, the conceding mode is a method where one party will allow the other party to have an acceptance. And this typically happens when something is not of as important in that power as someone else. And what is not as important to one as it may be the other. For instance, the one that I always like to say is when the buyer or the seller says, well, we've already pulled the title work. Well, we all know that the buyer has the right to ask for the title company. Typically, I tell a lot of my agents, hey, let them have that one because it doesn't really matter. Public records, public record, all right? Virtually all the prices should be roughly in that same ballpark of being the same. There is, should be no difference. So if we concede that point and say, oh, well, we want this, but we let you choose your title company, there's the item we gave up in that conceding type of mode. Same thing with the acceptance mode. 
the acceptance mode obviously neglects anybody's own concerns, all right? It is viewed as giving in. That's the acceptance mode. And a lot of times, a lot of sellers or buyers will use this simply to try and wear the other person down and hope that they give in on that particular topic or item. The retreating mode um, is, is not really assertive. It's usually uncooperative and usually will lead to the breakdown of the deal altogether. It's typically the avoidance of an issue. We're not going to deal with it or let's not make, make that an item. Let's not bring that in. We are not going to deal with that issue. That is called the retreating mode. And then there's the Allah mode. Booyah! <laughs> eh, they all can't be winners, all right? Um, so let's go back and kind of revisit real quick. The cooperative, uh, both parties are important. It's a long-term negotiation. Typically in the real estate world, we don't seek this out. We seek more of what's called the competitive mode. It's quick decision, defending your important issues and protects the negotiator. It is seen as a win-loss. Uh, the conceding mode, this is when both parties have equal balance. For instance, there is never a great negotiation when the CEO is negotiating a price uh, pay increase or pay reduction with a janitor. Not a lot of conceding there, a lot of imbalance of power. So you have to understand that in our system, hopefully the buyers and sellers have equal power. Where you see this fail is when we get into the strong buyer's markets or seller's markets and one has the upper hand for instance, if you're in a seller's market and there are 10 buyers making offers, I have had agents call me and go, hey, they're not responding. Well, they have the power right now because if you wanted it yesterday, you'll probably want it today whether they responded or not because if you didn't, there's nine more guys waiting in line for you. So when those get thrown out of whack because of the market being extremely slanted towards a buyer or the seller, that can throw the balance of power out, which actually can shift the negotiation type of mode, okay? Uh, the acceptance mode. Um, so there's other kinds of modes that you would have to use, and this is how you would use them when dealing with the which mode are you going to be in? Now you can shift back and forth. You can be in a conceding mode on one point, but be in a competitive mode on the other. And you will see that that is very important depending on what is one of the largest elements that we're dealing with. But like I said, in the real estate game, most of the time, the only element that we are arguing is price. Realize that what I'm discussing here is for negotiations in general. You negotiate every day. You negotiate with your children about doing their homework or going to bed or with your wife about what's for dinner or with your friend about which ball game do you want to watch. So there are, these rules apply to all the negotiations and you have to understand that there are ways to, to do that. And that's what I'm saying. So in the real estate realm, this is actually a lot of it's already defined for us. We already know what we're dealing with. We already know what we're willing to trade. Those kind of issues are the important things that we know in the negotiation. Um, to be a good negotiator, you have to have active listening skills. You actually have to hear what the other uh, party's saying. My wife says to me all the time, you listen to me, but did you hear me? And I'm like, I'm sorry, did you say something? <laughs> and then she usually hits me, all right? Emotional control is probably the number one thing that you have to have as an agent. This is the one of the key things and one of the main reasons why we are brought into this to begin with. We are a middleman that is supposed to regulate 
any kind of emotional outburst or emotional control. I had a situation several years ago, another agent started yelling at me about the offer that we submitted and I literally hung up on him. I called him back in about two or three minutes. I'm like, dude, are you done yelling? Because you understand this is not my offer. It is not your offer. This is merely an offer that I am conveying with you. And you've all heard the term about don't shoot the messenger. Well, that's literally what we're talking about here. You must remain emotionally neutral in this because either way, this is not my deal. It's not your deal. We are merely the middleman that is helping communicate these two offers and counter offers between our principles. Have to be a strong verbal communicator. You have to be able to clearly and effectively disclose what your client wants or the benefit that he's seeking. Same thing on your side. You have to be able to disclose or write what your client is seeking. We have to be in collaboration. Now, this isn't necessarily a strong thing when I mean with each other. We have to be in strong collaboration with, with our clients so that we can understand and then we communicate with you on the other side of the table. Have to be a problem solver. This is one of the key things that I really enjoy is solving the problem. Can we seek a solution? Is there a way that maybe you don't need cash? Could I get you something other than cash to solve the problem? Let's come up with an answer. Instead of focusing on the goal, you need to focus on the journey and realize, can we get there in a different manner? And you have to have the decision-making ability. Now, this is really part of what I was just talking about again. We don't really have the decision-making ability. That is the principles portion of this deal. Do we accept the number the buyer gave us? Do we accept the number the seller countered back? So that decision-making ability is part of that collaboration that you would have with your client or principal in the deal. Obviously, interpersonal skills are going to be great. Someone that is very social, that understands and can read another person. One of the bad things about this technology that we have got going now is the fact, much like now, you can hear my voice, but you can't see facial inspections, you can't see hand gestures, you can't see things of that, which is how we actually communicate. A lot of our communication is through nonverbal gestures and ideas and, and uh, concepts. So doing it through either email or on the phone makes it harder and makes it much more uh, difficult on you to understand the interpersonal skills that you need to be able to communicate effectively. Hey, here's the offer and we're doing this. You know, it's not a mean offer. It's a nice offer. And I don't even know how to, to do that because of the reason I'm telling you, you know, uh, I can't smile when I'm t talking like now and go, Hey, this is a funny joke because you can't see that as opposed to, Hey, this is a funny joke. So the interpersonal skills are tough. Ethics, ethics is probably the number one thing. I have to assume that you're working ethically. I do that with every agent. And I tell my clients, hey, he's a professional. I am going to trust that they are doing their job professionally. Well, I don't think they submitted my offer. I don't believe that. I believe he has ethics, he has to abide by the ethics, and he will continue to work like a professional, and therefore we need to assume that. If your offer did not get accepted because it was not the highest and best, the assumption is you didn't give a good offer, not that he didn't offer it. I am not going to portray that upon the other agent. I'm going to assume he's ethical because that is what we should do. Now, when you're going to make your offer in this first negotiation, there is this whole concept of 
Should I make an offer that's a low value? Do I want to try and be a thief or do I want to give a fair, honest value? I think you should always give an honest and fair value when you're making your offers. Now there is that whole concern of what can I afford versus what it's worth. And I know that there have been people out there that have said this before to you about, well, do you want the buyer's approval letter to say 150 because you're writing an offer at 150, even though he can afford 200? And there are some agents that go, yes, I want one at 150 because I don't want them to think that we can afford 200. You know what? I can afford a steak. When I go to McDonald's, I'm only still paying for a McDonald's because that's what it's worth. So I used to believe that until I've had a change of heart about 10 or 12 years ago. And now I just tell our lender, write me one approval letter for whatever he's worth. And if it's more than what we offer, hey, that does, that's irrelevant. Just because I can afford a $200,000 house doesn't mean I'm going to buy a $200,000 house, especially if my client thinks it's worth $150,000. All right. So when you try and negotiate, don't try and steal property. If you want to be a thief or help a thief buyer, that's fine. Uh, I'm not a big proponent of that. Now, once again, we are not discussing properties that are marked or listed at a value that's not true. And I wouldn't really call that stealing anyway. If something's got a house where the comps say it's worth 150 and they've got it listed at 200 and you write a 150 offer, I don't consider that stealing. Um, that is what the house is worth. All right. Uh, when you're negotiating, sometimes you've got to grant concessions. And this is the problem that we run into that a lot of times, since we're only negotiating price, we really can't get into concessions. I mean, we can't give up. Well, I will only take part ownership or I only want to own it on Mondays. The only concessions that we typically have is price. So when you have to think about that, we really don't have a lot of negotiation room because in this defined negotiation of real estate, we have taken out a lot of the other potential things that a true negotiation could argue. When you're negotiating with your wife, there's a lot of things that you can take away or add in. Like, hey, if we go to the movies tonight, I'll do dinner by dinner for two weeks. If we don't mow the lawn and let me take a nap, I will give you a back massage. So there's a lot of things in a true negotiation that you can leave yourself negotiation space. In the real estate world, that's a little harder because it is such a defined activity of give me the house, I'll give you money. There's not a lot of room for there. So virtually the only thing that we can negotiate is that value or that money. If you're in a position to grant concessions, make sure that you grant concessions wisely. All right. Never give one without getting one. Don't give up the farm if they're not going to do something for you. Like, hey, I'll give you cash, but I want to close in three days. All right. Keep count of what's going on. Make sure that you don't get, well, I've granted you four or five things and you've only granted me one. Therefore, we're never going to uh, come to a deal. All right. Uh, there's all kinds of other things that you need to consider when granting concession. Never grant your number one concession out of the gate. If you do, you have nothing left to bargain with and anything that you have left to bargain with is going to seem minor in comparison, which could look like a step backwards. So always start negotiations with the least valuable thing to you. I don't mean necessarily money. I mean to you, okay? Um, you gotta be a problem solver. So make sure that you understand in that competitive bargaining mode that you can try and solve problems for the client. It's not important that you request concessions. 
It's just that you need to know if you do, what will you get? What's the interest of the other party? Sometimes it's in an interest to give something to the other side early to show that you have strong incentives in making sure the negotiation carries forward. All right. Once again, I like to give them, hey, here, I'll, we'll let you have the title work. We want a home and warranty. Don't use threats. Threats are never a good thing. Threats usually take the form of if then, if you don't do this, then I'm going to do that. In the real estate world, it's kind of hard to make a threat. You know, your threat is, hey, this is my last offer. That's about the best we can give. If you ever use that as a topic and you say, here's my final offer, you can never make another offer because if you do, you have now ruined you as any kind of credible negotiation in that deal. And I don't mean you as in the agent, I mean you as at that collective side. If you keep saying, what's my last offer? And they come back and you go, okay, I'll take, okay, we'll lower it 10 more. Okay, we'll lower it 10 more. And you keep blowing through your threat, then what kind of credibility are you going to have? And if you're going to use that, you need to make sure that you're strategic and make sure it's understood that this is the potential deal breaker in the, in the property or in the deal. Okay. Make sure your threat's not based on emotion. Don't get mad. And then all of a sudden not deal with them. Well, I don't like that offer. So never don't respond to them. Dude, that's a buyer that we're getting rid of. Understand that we don't have a lot of buyers on the hook. You might not want to, let's calm down. The other thing a threat can do is it can incite another threat from the other side. And usually the second threat gets bigger than the first threat. So understand that if you're going to do something that you could potentially get retaliation against you. All right. Um, any, there's some conclusions. We negotiate every day. You need to practice perfectly to make sure you're perfect. And it's remember, it's not about us. It's about the client. The one thing I always try and tell them is remember that the person on the other side is trying to do the same thing for them and their family that you're trying to do for your family. So always understand that there truly is another person on that other side and they're trying to be as human as possible so that you don't want to just crush them. That is something that I hold true in my negotiation. I don't want to take every last dollar that person has and sure, yeah, you bought the house, but now you can't afford to even eat dinner tonight. That is just me. Also understand you got to give a little to get a little. Um, that's typically what the, the old saying is. If you want to give a negotiation, you've got to get a negotiation. Now here's the four methods that we've talked about. The last one that avoidance. That's the game of chicken that you get to play. Are you just going to ignore it? And yes, I did say chicken. Well, I'm telling you, this section has run a little long, but I squo squoze, is that a word? I squeezed in a two hour CE course in about 28 minutes on negotiation. And if you have more interest in learning how to negotiate, we do have a continuing ed course that is entirely two hours in length that will go through everything, including practice scenarios, so that you can become better at negotiating with both your client in the listing or helping your client negotiate with the other side of the table. So we're going to come right back. Hold on. You're listening to the 30-hour post-licensing course. And I'm Raymond Modulin, the director of Real University. So if you have any of these questions, Feel free to email me at raymond at realuniversity.com.